um, the creative side and um, visualization and painting is, is both common for both of us as a superpower. Oh, wow. Excellent. I love that. All right, what, what I'm going to do yeah. now is I'm going to, oh. I'm going to pop everyone back in. Yeah. And um, I'll put you in groups of four. Um, I'm feeling a bit lazy today, so I haven't, I'm not going to set everyone up into the groups in this, into the same twos. Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to mix you up again. So you're in <laughs> groups of four. Um, and um, let's let's do the let's use the app. It's the first time I've used the app, so okay. So I'm going to create some more rooms, and again, just have the same conversation again. Maybe there's some new people, um, and that's quite exciting as well. So we will get to meet some more people. So uh, I'm going to open them now, um, and on you go. What's your superpower? And we'll give a bit longer this time. I think, um, yeah. Ah, oh, look who it is. <laughs> you're right, you're on mute, you're on mute. Hi, Yuri. Hi there. Good Hi to guys. see you, man. Hey, yeah. Hey, guys. Hi, mate. Ah, oh, you did the metrics session. Yes. Of course, that's, that's Yuri. Yes, I did the metrics. That's you, right, you, that's I right. You, I couldn't see, I couldn't see your name at the bottom. A really good session. <laughs> Haven't yet had a chance to give the feedback. I've been bragging about it. You're actually on the agile world as well. I've I was going to say, you got, you got a shout out. I gave you a shout out. It's <laughs> all so good. Right, right, how long has he gave us? How long has he gave us? He's given us a couple more minutes. Okay, because the, the, the conversations are, it's like, it just never, ever feels like you've got enough time. No. Mm. Yeah. We'll, let, we'll let these two go first. Yeah, because we'll we talk too much. We're going to shut up, part. right? <laughs> on, yous, on yous go. We'll, we'll listen. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's Gwen Leeson from London. Um, I'm South African born, by the way. So I've been in, in the UK for about 13 years. Um, yeah, um, I always struggled at school, grammar wise. Um, I almost didn't make it to school. They wouldn't put me through typing. So they were going to say, you're going to be a typist for the rest of your life. My mom was a, a school teacher and she really worked hard with me. And then, yeah, I got through school. I think my superpowers in summary is really... Um, looking at wacky creative ideas. So when I work with agile teams or problem teams, we come up with these really, I come up with these really strange ideas, and um, and and they they respond to it in a different kind of way. But I think that's one of my superpowers is thinking out of the box. And the second one is I'm very hypersensitive. So when I walk into a room, I can pick up when people are drawing away or the person's in the corner or someone needs to be brought into a conversation. I'm quite sensitive. To a lot of things and the people's emotions i can read and, and understand people so i think that's my my superpower really that's an amazing superpower you know what i'm finding through these discussions is um i just spoke to a lovely lady um and she just highlighted her saying that she's really good about uh, connecting things together and actually doing research and i think every single person i hear i think well actually i can do a bit of that anyway sorry who wants to go next Okay, so I go next. I guess while well, talking about my superpowers, is uh, well, I just talked to, to Anne uh, in this one to one room. Uh, well, in fact, I'd say, uh, well, my superpower is that I can uh, pick up and learn any language quite quickly. And it's not only about that, you know, learning language to communicate, but I'd like uh, always to delve deeper into details to understand the logic behind native speaker's brain. Um, and th this is this is quite interesting. And I'd say that very, very interesting because I'm not dyslexic myself, but I find a situation that when you speak more than two or three languages, it, you know, it does happen to me, for example, that I have a word, uh, whether it be I don't know, English or Spanish, because I, I'm technically not an English speaker, but uh, I, my first language is Russian, the language I acquired when I was a kid. So, and sometimes it's just, you know, I have a word in my head, uh, you know, that is, uh, sounds like, <laughs> so, but I, 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 I can't remember the word, help to pronounce it, but I can't remember the meaning behind that. And this is, 
uh, it does happen. I don't know why is that, but it does happen. Um, so it, it, I'd say, well, I, I was thinking about that uh, because it's very interesting. I, I do not know much about dyslexic, but uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's more about like, you know, like you have this, uh, this uh, you know, this, I, I, I'm not sure if we, whether it's a problem or what, but uh, you have this thing in your head when you speak more than two or three languages, because I also, well, I also speak Spanish as I'm currently based in Argentina. So, and yeah, it's, uh, this is something that, uh, that happens to me. And, uh, and I don't know that uh, we could say that, uh, you know, uh, a foreigner could be a dyslexic at some point, uh, you know, where, um, but uh, don't have much to say for now, because I, I should think about it more. But yeah, yeah. I fully get what you're saying. My father being, his origin being Sicilian, uh, mm -hmm. My dad can mix up his words sometimes, and even though he's been in the UK since he was 19 years old, and I, I had a different upbringing, so I used to be going back and forth from Sicily to England, so I get both cultures. But I, one thing I've learned over the years with my father is he, a lot of the time, he's almost translating things from Sicilian to English when he's talking, uh -huh. and European languages, most of you your understand through Spanish, a lot of things are said backwards, so like my car in Italian you'd say car mine and and he, he struggles with that as well trying to get that the right way so that sounds it sounds similar yeah. and it could be a um in fact, I, I couldn't say this is the same because, you know, mixing up languages, yes, but I, what I noticed, what I noticed, so I've been living here for six years for now. So what I noticed that, you know, in a few years, uh, well, I don't know, I, I, I'm speaking about myself. Uh, I'm not sure about, you know, the majority of people because everyone is different. But I noticed that, you know, I, I don't have this problem. I don't have, a, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not mixing up Russian Russian or Spanish or English. If I talk English, I talk English. Well, okay. If I speak Spanish, I speak Spanish. If I speak Russian, which is not that <laughs> frequent uh, thing uh, that happens nowadays, uh, well, I, I speak Russian, no problem. But yes, you can forget. So, you know, sometimes you, you struggle uh, finding a word even in uh, your first language because, you know, these limits uh, that you have, you know, your first language, second language, uh, uh, if you're living in another country, which, uh, you know, your first language is not the main language or maybe it doesn't exist even. So, um, you know, this limit uh, fades away over time. So it fades away. So I mean, to, to me, uh, I, you know, many times I, I I feel more comfortable speaking English than you know, Russian. It's it's just it's just a, a part of the past uh, at some extent. So uh, this is this is quite interesting. This journey is 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 quite interesting in this sense. How about you, Seth? You've got to deal with me on a day to day basis. <laughs> that's, that's that's the easy bit. No, I I, I I'm not dyslexic. I, I have um. I have a daughter who has learning disabilities, so I'm always interested in these types of sessions and really what people have experienced and what they go through. So listening to my, you know, my good friends, Sabrina and Carl and, and, and Scott sharing their personal stories and, you know, the challenges they faced and, you know, the stigma around these things. Yeah, I mean, that's why I posted in the chat, you know, it, it takes a lot of courage to do that sort of thing. I find it inspiring when people do. Uh, and you know, as my daughter also has, I, I'm doing everything I can to give her the opportunities, but I expect she will, you know, suffer a fair deal of challenges in her life because you know she she's nearly twenty and you know she 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 reads at a very basic level. You know, her communication skills are limited. She takes a while to express herself, uh, and you know, unfortunately, sad though it is, the world will not always be kind to her. You know. Uh, and that's 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 why I, I join these things, and it matters to me, and that everybody gets an opportunity, and and, and people don't label them, you know, to what Dove said. So, I, so you know, I, I I'm a polymath, you know, I just do things, you know, I do whatever, and you know, I, I draw, you know, I write, you know, I'm just good at maths. We're all different, you know. So I can, you know, I visualize stuff. I'm a visual thinker. So I, you know, I draw. I drew as a kid. That was my passion. My, my parents stopped me from going to, to art college because <laughs> they thought, how are you going to make a living? <laughs> it's mental. But anyway, yeah. So, yeah, I, I do. I, I think it's important that we don't label people. 
So my superpower ability, I've mentioned a little bit about this on, on earlier, it is my communication skills. It's my ability that um, in my work life, I'm not scared to talk to anybody in any level at all. Um, and the reason being for that is, it's more fearful for me to write an email than it is for me to actually go up and speak to them. Um, and it takes me ages to write an email or write a presentation. I have to, I always pre-warn people and I, I'm always very open now recently about me being dyslexic. Um, if somebody needs me to write a document or presentation, I'll say, okay, you're gonna have to give me a few days on that because I will go through it and go through it and go through it. Um, even writing a, a post on social media, I do some of the social media for Agile 20 Reflect. Seth's my first person I go to if I can't get my brain working or if my confidence level has gone down. I know I've got support, I can go to Seth. As an example, he's my wordsmith. He will always give me a hand on that. So it's always nice to can have. I, can, can, I, can I just say, I don't want to interrupt her, but her stuff is very good. Oh, so there's, really? always, there's, there's, there's always that self-doubt thing as well, right? Oh, Sabrina yeah, doubts yeah. herself, but her stuff is good. I'm just a bit pedantic. and She says I wordsmith. So I'm in the narrative, but the stuff she produces is great. But she probably doesn't feel that way, right? He's my little support network. But it's good to have that. But I do find actually being open about it, and I've been open about it in my work, you find more people become more confident to be open about it. So since I've been open, I said, you know, every person I meet or every time I run a training course or every time um, I'm running a session, the first thing I say is I'm dyslexic. Some of the work that you'll see, things will be backwards. I know we're just before we it. before we drop off. Just very important. It is great we're doing this session. I told you that earlier in the week. So when this one becomes available, we need to get it out there because this will be very valuable and inspirational to a lot of people. Yeah. Right. Got eight, seven, six seconds. I'll see you guys back in the room. We did well. Okay. Good to see you guys. You. And here's all the lovely people back. Is that what the other office looks like? <laughs> Hello. Yeah. I I've got a connection. Would someone else like to um, hold the um, the play button? Uh, so I, I've got it recording, don't worry. So I think yeah, Scott's you... asking for facilitation. So um, how yeah. many groups were there in the last session? Right, I can read. Just, get, just ask every, every group to talk, yeah. Right, how many okay. people do you, are you doing this, um, Carl, or do you want me to do it? Go ahead. Okay, right. Let's have a look, how many rooms do we want? So we want bigger rooms this time. So we had four in one room, let's do six. Is uh, that no. automatically? No, no it's, we're okay. It's, oh, no, this is the plan, Sabrina. I'm losing it's, you. It's the final facilitation Sabrina. where it's all. So right. now we get some feedback from the last groups okay. um, and share that and see what what lines up and what doesn't and also what the new thinking is. So, Right. Uh, Who wants to go first? Scott, uh, on a side note, sorry sorry for interrupting Sabrina. Just okay. an idea for Scott. You should start collecting data on these things because uh, if you organize these things every year or something, you're going to see the number of dyslexics dramatically increasing. As people come out <laughs> themselves, I'm sure in twenty years you'll be you'll be happy if you kept uh, the data on an Excel sheet. <laughs> well, I, well, in the chat I've dropped a, a Google uh, a Google form, so yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. We're, we're hoping to actually create a group, um, so then we're all there to lean and support each other and learn new things. So yeah, please drop into the chat and um, fill in the Google form if you feel comfortable. Thank you very much. Right, who would like to go first? You shouldn't say that in such a way. It sounds like an imperial overlord. <laughs> I am to you guys. Don't, don't tell them what my... Who's standing is. nearest the edge of the cliff? <laughs> um, go on, Paul. No, I, I've done a lot of talking. I think I'd like to hear from other people. Um, well, I think the, the, there was two common themes, because um, obviously it was in two groups. Uh, and the two things that were brought up in both um, was people uh, are compassionate um, and they have great empathy skills. So a lot, lot better on the kind of interpersonal behavioral skills um, above and beyond uh, people who are not dyslexic. It was a, a common theme. 
Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Chair. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Who else would like Building to on that, um, I was in with Christine and Anne, and we were talking about how because we've already worked through challenges in our lives, we're so much more comfortable in the unknown and the complexities and being wrong um, all the time <laughs> and learning from that and growing from that, right? Oh, 100%. It is yeah, almost like we've got true. a bit more of a, a thick skin when it comes to it, but also we do like our challenges. That's amazing. Yeah. 100%. From, from my party was... Uh mostly learning over the years to stop justifying myself and explaining explain why I do things my way, a certain way to everybody else. I just don't care anymore. I just, it's the way I am and uh, it's not my job to make people accept me uh, for who I am. That was the biggest growth dimension for me. Well, and the hardest, probably. <laughs> it's not being ashamed because there's nothing to be actually ashamed about nothing to be ashamed about there's something that came up in both of the groups i was in was um deeper understanding and wider understanding and and um different understanding as well because we're not we've been subject to an education system but we've still found our own way mm -hmm. Um, and that own way is, is probably one of the things we use now more than the education system that we were subject to. <laughs> so that was really interesting. Yeah, we talked about uh, thinking outside the box, basically yeah. really being able to see things that others don't and come up with creative solution that are not really part of the pattern or the norm. Yeah, we had one that come up in our group that I thought was really good, which would be in hypersensitive. So um, an example that was given of being able to go into a room and being sensitive to people's feelings and emotions and know what's going on and who to bring into a conversation and who's not to bring into a conversation, which was right. So many things that I've heard in some of the rooms I've been in, and I don't know if anyone else has felt the same, that you've, you've kind of almost been re reminded your other superpowers that you've not thought of. Because I think we are all probably very similar. It is yes, true. I mean, it's true. I'm... I, I always, I, I call myself, my personality, a bit of a, a chameleon. Um, my husband <laughs> always finds it a bit strange how I can walk into a room and I can automatically um, sympathize and, and work very closely with so many different people, ages, personalities, cultures. And we always called it me being a bit of a chameleon. And ideally now I'm realizing from speaking to people that maybe it's not, it's actually another superpower I have because I'm dyslexic. Yes, I think it's listening also because we listen a lot deeper. I think, I feel, I feel like the listening is really deep and the desire to truly connect to the other person on an honest level as opposed to a superficial one. Yes, myself and Katerina were talking about that actually in our room. Who else would like to go? These, this I is think great. Maru mentioned, <laughs> sorry. Go on, Anna, yeah, I think uh, Maru mentioned about one more thing, which is humor. So Maru, I think you missed talking about it. <laughs> I was I was talking about um, me, me having developed humor in my childhood as my. I don't want to do, go into much psychological explanations, but uh, it it can backfire, especially as I moved uh, from Morocco to Germany as a kid, and it hasn't worked very well with Germans uh, over twenty years. I have a lot of data to back that up. But because I traveled a lot, I'm at 87 countries now. It's my biggest passion. I've had to experience it. I've got to experience it with a lot of other people. And it's, it's my greatest superpower. And uh, I think empathy and being vulnerable, etc., are big components to play with humor because unconsciously you use them as levers to connect with people, make them laugh about things that might have hurt them before. Or, or, or you know, even if these things are unknown to them, um, I find it's maybe it's my personal style, but it can backfire. That was my main, <laughs> my main comment. I think one of the other things that came up is that um, dyslexics don't mind failure because we've been told all our lives. We're used so, to it. <laughs> we're used to it. And and in agile, where it says uh, uh, fail fast, we're kind of like, yeah, okay, <laughs> I can do that. Um, but also, it means that we we don't have this. Um, power 
game that people play about oh you're a failure well actually if you look at what how people live everyone fails at some points we've just had a lot of experience of being told that we are failed um and so in agile um we're more inclusive i think i think we just we we are more open to other people because um we know that we aren't perfect and never will be <laughs> And we're content about it. Yeah, thank, thankfully. Yeah, <laughs> I think that is that is what came in uh, one of our discussions as well, accommodating. So yeah, they accommodate a lot of people and, and their ideas. One more thing also that I was thinking that I feel that it's easy for me to do is to be able to anticipate things. So I'm always like three, four step ahead. And I was telling in my group how I just kind of, you know, we're all getting ready to do something and everybody's on board and I can already tell how that's going to end. And I'm the only one that sees that and it ends up ending that way. You know, it's just like the ability to kind of project yeah. how this is all yeah. going to work out. Yeah. So I don't know if you all feel that way, but I certainly feel like it's yes. something that I'm always do. Yeah. But then when you say this, they look at me saying, what like this crazy weird right? woman is talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get until it happens like oh she was right <laughs> I, I feel exactly the same way i always feel like cassandra it's awful it's truly truly awful sorry no i was just going to continue that um as a as a woman as well it's different it's different being a woman dyslexic to being a man who's dyslexic um so yeah yep and um oh, oh, tell me from my observation uh, tell me the is oh Ah, well, Scott. it's it's interesting, Scott, because uh, uh, my dad's also dyslexic, so it's very interesting to see the differences generation-wise and also the differences between <coughs> being a guy and being a woman. So Carl said earlier that he would call himself um, a polymath, and like I see this time and time again, lots of uh, older men in the tech industry are dyslexic and you can go around and call yourself a polymath and, or a generalist and I have never in my life seen a woman be called a polymath. I couldn't mm. spell it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I've just got a highlight this I'm surprised no one's brought it up yet and it's the first thing I say to Scott and Carl is why spell dyslexic in a way that none of us can actually spell the <laughs> thing. Yeah it's horrific. <laughs> So, so, so Anne, I think that's really interesting. Though. So you're you're really calling in the the, the gender uh, bias as well as dyslexia we, bias. Yeah, and we must do it for race as well. Yeah, and we must we must understand dyslexic people in their context. So my context as a dyslexic matters all the time. The context of me being dyslexic within my very neurodiverse family very different from my context in my workplace. Where people who are dyslexic or autistic or ADD are in a minority. Uh, yeah. Scott, you were trying to say something. Are you still losing connection, darling? No, I think John was trying to. Oh, John PC was just about to start there? saying something. Yeah, I was. Um, so thanks for that, Carl. Um, yeah, I was just getting back to Carol's point and uh, remembering something that Sheila said in the uh, session as well is the, the whole presenting of that foresight uh, and then, uh, it's not always a good thing um, because <laughs> nobody really likes a told you so um, it, it is very very hard yeah, to refrain you to yourself <laughs> yeah so. you just it can be it's very hard sometimes to refrain smile. yourself from actually sharing your your uh, precognition of what's going to happen but sometimes it can but, work but, to your but advantage it, because you can lead people through the, the thought process so that they can come to that realization themselves. And then you can work on solving it so it won't end that way, yeah, um, which I've yeah. managed to do a few times. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. The other thing is, if in both the groups that I was in, we talked about um, seeing in, um, not in words, not two-dimensionally, but more three-dimensionally. And in, in today's world, everything is so networked together. If you can see a, a problem in three dimensions, if you can see the, um, the, the shape of it, then that's an advantage. That's a huge advantage because I think most people think and see things in two dimensions. Like if, if you look at something that's a diagram, 
most people are seeing the two dimensions on the paper, but some people are seeing a third dimension and seeing the flaws in it, if there are any. And then you can help people. I, I remember there was a book about, um, I think his name is Fenneman. Surely you're joking, Mr. Fenneman. And he said he went into the Tennessee Valley Authority and was looking at some diagram. And he was brought in as the expert and he just pointed at something and said, what that? And they all go, oh my gosh, you're right. That's terribly wrong. Mm. And another thing like that is my family lived near Thomas Edison. I didn't, but my ancestors did. My, and they told me that he was the, the teacher sent him home from school and said he was too dumb to learn. So he was probably dyslexic or something like that. But he was a great inventor. But as, as a child, they were saying, ah, oh, he's too dumb to learn. Just forget it. Give up on him. Because he thought differently. <laughs> A child or any, it's, it's, any weak person who cannot defend herself it doesn't have to be a child. Some people are part of minorities or in a situation in a context where they are the minority. I was in consulting for many years and, and they all used to tell me, you cannot focus, you, you, you're not meaning dumb um, because you can't do one thing well and uh, we cannot follow you, everything's too complicated, meaning you can't analyze, that was what was implied, you can't analyze properly. And um, my strength before was in research where I was doing my PhD in postdoc. And when I got back to, to uh, freelancing and free consulting, that became my strength again. Um, it's, uh, you know those characters that are kind of like cult-like business gurus? 60 plus, 70 plus, like they've snowed them, they tell you stuff. And you can't even, it takes you a couple of seconds to, to, to switch in the gears and understand where they came at it from, etc. You know, these guys are super smart uh, and people might have judged them in a very different way before by saying, no, you're not thinking about this the same way as other people are thinking about it in, in this consulting company. It means implied you're dumb. You don't belong to the culture, basically. I have been in a, in a what's supposed to be a support group. It's, it's called an accountability group with a bunch of executives. And in the last two meetings I attended, I was told that I was all over the place. And then I needed to focus. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think that's the same thing, that it's still there. And it hadn't really registered that that was the problem because I was just like, what the heck are you guys talking about? <laughs> can, I, can, I, um, can I come in here a little bit? When we set the festival up, I, uh, I got the trustees together and Anurag was there, so he'll tell you he was there at the beginning. Um, and I started outlining everything we needed to do. And everyone looked at me as if it's too complicated. So I went away and I thought about it. I thought, well, how can we pull this into something we can understand? Um, and I came up with um, um, the principles because I had to write the principles down to explain to everyone else what it was we're doing, even although I saw it was really easy. Um, and the only person that got this was Carl. So Carl came in and within like three conver three sentences, he knew exactly what I was trying to do. Yeah, and that's just with two dyslexics talking at high power. It's like it's like a, if it's the thing of the old modems. Carl and I, Carl and I's modems are on set on dyslexic. So we, Carl was the only one that. And I remember talking to Carl saying, "Can you talk to some people and just try and explain it again? Because I've done it and it's not it's not registering." <laughs> and and the reason was Scott was I took your principles and built a model of the entire festival in my mind. <laughs> That, that's what I did. I, I modeled which, which I modeled helped. the whole thing. And then I asked you some questions because I wanted to know the motivations behind the principles yeah. because principles are fine, but if the starting point is not in the right place, then the principles can produce horrible experiences for people. And, and I know that because I work in user experience. It's about the journey, not, not just the filter. And... Um, you gave me the right answers you know you, you know you, you were clear about what the intent was and then i found this video that you did online and i had at this point i hadn't committed you know because i i, I it's very difficult to get me to commit to stuff because I, I don't i don't help other people with their visions because i've got enough of my own um as an entrepreneur i try and do them but um I saw this video and this video was actually like from a couple of months before I got involved. And it was, it was Scott just talking about why he wants to do the festival because uh, of his friend Martin and how uh, at the point uh, before, I'm sorry, I'm sharing your personal stuff, but it is on YouTube. So it's your own fault. 
at the point yeah, when you, when, you when Martin them. died, they weren't talking because of their their views on their versions of Agile. And I'm going, well, that's the impetus. Now, now I get it, and it's one of mine as well. I, I really don't care what flavor of Agile you're into. I'm not interested in the slightest. Can you get it to work? Can you make people's lives better? Can you help the clients? Can you evolve the products and systems? And, you know, if if you come back to me and say, I've invented a, my own version of Agile, I'll go, fine, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but don't try and sell it to me because I'm not, I'm not buying certificates and I'm not buying, you know, new methods. I, I'm interested. But, you know, part of what we do in Agile is because of who we are not just what we learned, so. Just a quick one uh, before we do wrap up because we're running over time, but this is absolutely amazing. So I don't know if some of you have seen, myself and Carl, we run a session daily called Agile World. And if anyone, we're looking for around about four people, if anyone would like to actually join us, it will be around about 15 minutes after this. Um, it gets recorded and then gets sent out. So we would love to hear some of your feedback, not just on a session, but also any of the events um, that have been part of Agile 20 Reflect that you've been on. <clears throat> so if you can just pop a message and your email address direct to me underneath if you'd like to join, um, and then I'll send you the Zoom details and the time that will be happening. That will be absolutely great because we are trying to get some participants to actually join us and talk about their experience on the other side. Sorry, carry on the conversation. <laughs> Oh. Now the advert's over. No. <laughs> yeah, that's my job. Right. Um, well, we can... yeah. um, where do you send that out? Is it a newsletter? Is it YouTube? It's YouTube. It's, it okay. goes onto right. YouTube, um, the Agile 20 Reflect LinkedIn. Um, if you're on our profiles, you'll see it come out on our profiles. Um, it's just that's basically it. a daily video wrap up that we do. And we run just quick interviews. We do a wrap up of what we've seen, our colleagues have seen. We've had Seth and, and, and Shelby on there before. Um, but we are looking to actually get people that have actually been physically participating in these sessions. So yeah, if you are interested, send the details over. That would be really great. And I'll, I'll send you the Zoom invite. It should be around about 15 minutes after this call because obviously we're on the call now. <laughs> Thanks so much. Fab. Has anyone got anything else? Sorry. Just, uh, I want to know where's Giles. I cannot believe he's not here. I don't know. <coughs> I think one, one thing that would be uh, interesting is to talk about the challenges. And uh, I have one very particular challenge that is a problem for me in the world of Agile and, and work in general is um, metrics and diagrams and graphs where they just confuse me completely. And I don't know if this is a me thing or a dyslexia thing. Just get rid of them completely. Unnecessary rubbish. I know, but we have to deal with that. So tell us, tell us what, tell us what you really think, John. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think metrics is an interesting one. And it's a, the burden of my life uh, in scaled systems because you're supposed to be able to have some way to report to the governance what you've done and what you've achieved. Um, so there's a few different talks on metrics happening in the festival. And there's this one guy who works at IBM mm -hmm. uh, who's got a talk called uh, Retrospective Radar, uh, which is really interesting. So it's a visual thing where they're using a radar diagram to state where they feel they are. So it's, it's very subjective. But what he does is he runs this with hundreds of uh, teams and then they run it through Watson to see what the common behaviors are. And they look to see, they look to put the, I'm not saying this is the right and the only answer. I'm just thinking this, what I saw was just so interesting. Um, they look to see what are relative to the skill sets of the teams for their success and uh, can it be replicated? You know, it, what are the similarities and what are the dissimilarities? So I just think there are things in metrics that can help, but uh, to, to what Seth is saying, you know, if, if I don't know if it was Seth or not, or, or John, I think it was John. It's uh, John. If, it, if it doesn't help, don't use it. <laughs> yeah, it's, no. it you got, you got to you got to find things that help. I, I keep, I've got low bandwidth, so I keep on cutting my picture out. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just, my question uh, was uh, more. I'm, oh. Oops, I'm sorry. Go ahead. My no, go on, no, go on. more about uh, my 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 personal trouble with being able to read certain graphs and diagrams that represent metrics. Uh, this is the trouble that I, I have with. So it's not the. I mean, the concept of it is problematic in itself, but the actual representation of the data in different types of graphs and multi-dimensionally, I have a hard time and it takes me time to look at them and understand them. If somebody were to project one on the wall and everybody else can see it, I'm the one that would not know what's on it until <laughs> it takes me quite a bit of time to analyze it. So I don't know if that's a dyslexia thing or just a me thing. So uh, you can have number-based dyslexia. It's not just words. Yes, yeah, possibly, so. yeah. I think I think there might be several things going on there, there, Carol. If I if I may, um, uh, don't be afraid to ask for things in alternative formats. Like I would also find that really difficult if it, I was reading off a screen. I would prefer to have a printout or have it on my own computer, mm -hmm. um, and be able to read it that way. Uh, the second thing, it's not always safe to do so. Uh, but oftentimes when I see stuff like that being presented, if I'm one of the, I, I'll be one of the first people to say, I am not sure what that means. And suddenly everyone else in the room also goes, yes, I too, I'm not understanding that. Um, so you can't always say that, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm never not shocked that I'm not the only one. So, so I, I often challenge <laughs> BS when I hear it in meetings. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've worked for a blue chip consultancy. And I never want to see another PowerPoint as long as I live. Uh, and it, it, they, they were just a total waste of effort. And I've, I've spent hours and hours producing stuff that no one ever saw. Um, and there's that cartoon about that. So uh, as Anne says, if you don't get it, ask them to explain it to the level of detail. If they created it, then they must understand it. Um, the, the, the most common one I ask is, where did you get the data from? And how can you prove it's true? <clears throat> a, and a other bit thing, of science. Which, yeah, yeah. Other thing, just to add on that, like uh, what I use personally is like uh, how it's gonna add value to what you're achieving as well. Why you need a metrics? Like, uh, is, is you measuring something, right? Like, uh, it's helping you to reach to your outcome or not? If it's not help, you muted yourself, bro. Yep. Uh, uh, sorry, I was saying uh, like uh, one thing I do is like uh, ask like uh, what, what this. Uh, is, is helping you this matrix and KPIs or SLA is uh, helping you to reach to your outcomes or not. I think you focus more on outcomes, like, okay, are we meeting our outcomes or not? Is this a matrix is just like a numbers, which looks, I think, good for management, but this uh, main focus should be on a outcome, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, have you met the outcome or not? Instead of, uh, uh, you know, cycle time and, uh, you know, different KPIs and percentages and everything. Does it make sense a lot of time? I think what... Yeah. One, one thing I'd add, add to that is um, yeah. sometimes it's not the actual, uh, it's, it could be the chart that's wrong. Um, you know, we in our company, we do a lot of data visualization um, and we go through several iterations before we get to that point of, of is that thing that we're trying to visualize self-explaining? Right. And, yeah. and it takes a lot of work and a lot of people will just chuck charts up there and then just do one version of it and think, yeah, yeah, everyone can understand this. No, we, we have to go through workshops. We have to do meetings. We have to talk to different people to get to a point of something. They can just look at it and immediately understand it. So sometimes it's the graph that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 the way it's the data is being presented is not the right way to present that information. Yeah. Absolutely. Does, does that Sorry. And, and oh, my, myself, I, I, I quite often uh, quote Tom Hanks. I mean, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I'm, I'm reminded many, many times of a really, really terrible joke. Um, and um, how is a joke like a UI? Because if you have to explain it, it's obviously not very good. Um, so if you, if you need the graph explained to you, then it's no good. It isn't so giving good. you the information that you need. Yeah. But there's so many of them out there, and it's mm. everywhere. You yep. know, in every meeting, it's on a, you know on some screen, and you're supposed to look at that and and completely absorb it and comprehend it. My brain refuses most of the time. Yep. We did a lot of work for, so, for an airport, and, and then they, we were going through a load of detail, making sure that it could cope for people who were colorblind. 
Um, yeah, that's the other thing too, yeah. And, and which was absolutely fine. And then we got told, yeah, but to work in the airport, you're not allowed to be colorblind. <laughs> so we're like, oh, we went through all that effort. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's an interesting one because I always quote because I do a lot do a lot of accessible design mm -hmm. uh, and 50 percent of all men are colorblind to some yep. degree but which uh, kind and, of colorblind were they going for oh, exactly so this to some degree uh, and the, the, the other thing is is 95 percent of all electricians are men do you feel safe mm. um <laughs> <laughs> there's two kinds of colorblind there was one team I worked on where there were three men that were colorblind two of them were red green and one of them was yellow blue so it, there wasn't a color combination you could pick where somebody wasn't going to be seeing shades of gray and brown so yes. then you use shades of gray and brown that's that's the thing is but you have shades. to make them different enough that it'll show up differently yes and so if you that's don't understand yeah. that shapes become much more powerful mm -hmm. rather yeah. than color so i've got a question right mm. okay and sorry, I, and on those, no no it's interesting i'm not sure if this is a dyslexic thing or it's just me okay so, <laughs> yeah right <laughs> if i see if i see something and let's say a pattern of data and it right it's like ocd i've got to I've got to tell someone about it. I've got to do something about it. I've got to get that data fixed. It makes me unbearable to work with the, with the festival because at three o'clock in the morning, I'll be going, we can't do that. <laughs> Look at this. It's horrible. It's, it's, and everyone else is going, it's just some words, Scott. It's just some data. And I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, my yeah. wife calls me like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, it, it's just... <laughs> it's your, it's your, inter it's your right. interpretation. It's your interpretation. And he's right about the three. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. I get like that too. <laughs> yeah, I do that as well. If it's, it's, it, it, if there's if there's digital things that are untidy, then I tend to go and fix them, and then tell people I'm not fixing them because otherwise they get on my case. <laughs> and you wonder how Carl works with me because I'm the complete opposite. <laughs> I I um I, I'm going to have to drop off in a sec, and uh, just wanted to say this has been fab. It's amazing how open everybody's been. It's been tremendous to hear everyone's personal stories. I was saying to Sabrina a moment ago in our breakout, it, these for me are some of the best sessions that we're having in the festival because they're people's personal stories and people are, are, are getting the space to talk openly about their challenges. And just to my friends, Scott and Carl and Sabrina, for their courage today to actually share their stories and talk about something which we, can be difficult for people to talk about and to surface. So when this recording, you know, gets issued, this will provide great inspiration to many people. So well done to all three of them. Thank you. Good oh, job. Actually, well done to everyone that's participated because that's Absolutely. it's it um, from a certain generation exposing this knowledge is it creates fear. Uh, and mm -hmm. so thank you for everyone to for being honest and sharing. And yeah. Let's uh, and, and, and let's um, I know. We put the chip, we put the um, the questionnaire out, and I'm hoping the questionnaire from that a few people want to form a group. Let's form a group, and we can also um, role model for people. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, more than happy to kind of help other people and uh, you know with, with tricks and things that I've found. Uh, yeah, and you can help us as well. Well, yeah. thank you very much, everybody. We've overrun by 30 minutes, but I think it's been very, very beneficial. Uh, we do appreciate you joining us. Thank you ever so much. For those who have private messaged me, uh, wait for an email. I'll be sending out the Zoom link in the next 15 minutes. So thank you very much for um, opting to come join us in Agile World. Other than that, I hope, please add us onto LinkedIn. Please keep the conversation going. Um, we will be setting up a group because we know there's going to be a lot more people that not only we can help, you can help us as well. We're a learning community. Um, and yeah, this has been great and we do appreciate it. It helps us in our confidence and it helps us as people and it's great to hear all your stories. Can I end, it? Can I end in a joke? Go for it. <laughs> Go for Dysle it. Dyslexics of the world, untie. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you very much, everybody. Well done, guys. Well done. Hope to speak to you all again soon. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Guys. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Sabrina, you talked about something that's a few minutes after. Yes, so myself and Carl, we do a video update um, on the Agile Festival every single day. We record it and then we send it out um, of that evening. And it's basically um, around everything that's been going on the Agile How Festival. How do I find it? Um, Agile World, you will be able to see it on um, the actual videos you'll see on our main LinkedIn page. You'll see the video. You asked if we wanted to join you. If you wanted to join us. Um, just drop us a message on LinkedIn to find out. So if you didn't want to do it today or you want to do it another day, um, drop us a message on the LinkedIn page or drop us a message direct and we'll, we'll fit you in a slot on one of the evenings. It's normally around about 5 p.m. UK time. We normally do record it and then we send it out later on in the evening and it goes out through our YouTube, our Facebook page and our LinkedIn page. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you for, for hosting. You're very welcome. Hope to speak to you again. Bye. Bye.